I'm speaking with Sarah Frazier, author of The Prince Who Would Be King, The Life and Death of Henry Stewart. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for asking me. Tell me a little bit about your interest in history and writing. I think my interest in history is really the same interest that they had in the Renaissance when they first began to rediscover the classics and use them as a lens through which to examine the present. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons. And also because uh, I'm curious. I like people. And these people live in such an extraordinary time and area and place. And the stakes of their lives seem to me so high. It's a matter of life and death a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And the making and breaking of nations and faiths and beliefs. So they're familiar and unfamiliar. And all of those things, I think, make good stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what sort of formal training do you have in history? Uh, I did a PhD at Edinburgh University. My first degree was in English literature, so I'm interested in writing, full stop. Mm -hmm. And I moved to history when I decided my children were going through Gaelic medium education. Mm -hmm. I had to bring Gaelic, Rishikila. They yeah. speak Gaelic to each other. Okay. And I thought somebody, one of us, my husband or I, must learn. And I became interested in Gaelic, and I became interested in the history of the language and the place of Celtic culture in Scotland and in the Highlands. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how it started. And okay. I did a PhD. So, um, so your interest in the area then is, it's a personal connection to the area that's, that's yes. what motivated you. Yes, yes, yes. And also I am married to somebody whose father was Lord Lovett. Shimi Lovett, who was the World War II commando leader mm -hmm. um, on Sword Beach, and his ancestor was the subject of my first book, Lovett of the 45, an old Highland chief. Mm -hmm. um, so, And the Frasers have been in the Highlands, in that part of the Highlands, for 700 years. Mm -hmm. So you can't help but fall over history the whole time, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the, uh, the book. Uh, the Prince Who Would Be King... The, what attracted me to it is that it is a stepping stone for me between Elizabeth I and James VI and I. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth I, Gloriana, the last of the Tudors, mm -hmm. the great queen of the Armada, Raleigh, Drake, the Sea Dogs, mm -hmm. she was the end of one era, the old medieval era. Mm -hmm. And James the Sixth of Scotland, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, inherited her thrones in 1603. And he came down and inaugurated uh, an era of the most dramatic transformation. The Stuart dynasty presided, disastrous as they were in lots of ways, mm -hmm. presided over a period of huge change. And Henry seemed to me a bit of a missing link between Elizabeth and James. And Henry is James's oldest son. He is the crown prince. He is the first prince born to be Prince of Wales of all the nations of, the, of Great Britain. So as I was reading the book, I've read part of it already. Um, one, I was struck by uh, just the writing style. You pack a lot of information in small sections. It's seamless. You know, you, you get a lot out of it and it's a smooth read. It's, it's very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me was how much, in a sense, there was chaos mixed with order. It seemed like a period of, as you said, there was, tr it's transition. You know, there was the, the religious problems. Um, it felt like rebellion and murder, assassination was around the corner for every leader out there. And I know this is, we're talking about, you know, a, a long period of time, you know, decades, um, many years. So it's not like the danger was constant day to day, but it still seemed like you had to worry year to year. Yes. I think also, um, this refers back to um, why am I interested in history and how it refers to the present. That's our period of religious turmoil. Mm -hmm. If you think of the uh, the religious element, the element of religious underpinning to the problems in the Middle East at the moment. Mm -hmm. That was 
our period of religious warfare and from the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s up to certainly the end of the Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648. Mm -hmm. there's, there's over a century when Europe, various countries in Europe, are at war with each other because of religion. And you're right, assassination attempts abound. People are assassinated or survive assassination attempts, but they only survive them until the next one. Mm -hmm. And uh, faith Faith is something that you will live or die for. I mean, it's all varieties of Christianity, but mm -hmm. but each to the other are heretics, mm -hmm. and it is almost their duty to convert by the sword. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, of course, the obvious example for us with that is the gunpowder plot mm -hmm. in 1605. James has been on the throne for two years, and he seems to have promised all things to all people. As you say, a bit of mend and make do. It is a bit chaotic. Mm -hmm. The Protestant Reformation in uh, the British Isles is only partially completed. There's a lot of Catholics. There are some Puritan Protestants. There's moderate Protestants. And the Catholics have realised that James is not going to lift the penal laws against them. And they undertake this terror plot of absolutely awesome ambition mm. and it is there to destroy the entire political nation mm -hmm. it is as if our i mean it's it's parliament all of parliament will be blown up the entire ruling class will be destroyed all the ro uh, the royal family except henry's sister elizabeth mm -hmm. she is a devout protestant she will be forcibly converted to catholicism and married probably to a spanish prince and Britain, the countries of Britain, will become puppet states of Spain, effectively. Job done. Reconversion, that's it. So, I mean, it is. It's, I mean, it's, it's a period of, of great, of extraordinary transformation. When I read about the gunpowder plot, I, is that the proper name for it? Yes, the gunpowder gun plot, yeah. Um, so at first, before, as I read it, I thought, okay, this was an attempt to assassinate James. Mm. Um, but now that you put it this way, that, that it really was, uh, it wasn't discriminating. It would destroy the whole structure of government. Mm. That's a lot more, um, that strikes me a lot harder to think about well, it that it's way. It's more ambitious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Shows you the scale on which they thought. Mm -hmm. Um, and Henry had to die. Henry was a target on that, of, of that. Mm -hmm. And, every year afterwards became, uh, a day of holy observance where you went to church to thank God for his his intervention in saving you from from the evil of the Pope. I mean, fear of popery, of the Jesuits, of the kind of vanguard, the shock troops of the Pope and the, and the Holy Roman Empire, saturated Protestant Christendom. Mm -hmm. um, it was, as one historian said, a solvent of loyalties like no other. If you if you agreed to any allegiance to the Pope, you were my enemy. Mm -hmm. that, if you were a Protestant. Oh, no, it very passionately held deep feelings. So I forget if you wrote it in the book or if I read this elsewhere, but the gunpowder plot, I guess it was suggested that that's where Henry sort of became more concerned about uh, martial affairs, you know, about war and conflict and preparing it. Is that correct? Or um, I think all he thought, what he thought was, um, the war is coming to our own country. It suddenly, it's, it's like those, uh, terror attacks that we have when they happen on, on our own soil, mm -hmm. in our homeland. We, it, it strikes us particularly acutely. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about over here at the moment, but in, in London, we, continually, mm -hmm. there are terror alerts, etc. Mm -hmm. And people react with emotion as mm -hmm. well as rationally to those. Mm -hmm. And I think Henry naturally had always had an interest in, um, the martial arts, the military arts. Mm -hmm. And he had been brought up by men who had fought in the religious wars in Europe mm. with um, the Dutch Protestants trying to break away from the domination of Catholic Spain mm -hmm. and France trying to resist Spain. So men who had fought in those conflicts had been raising Henry from the age of four. Mm. So this, th he was very versed in the discourse of, of religious warfare. Um, and in this period, as we know, the, the bottom line of kingship 
is when and how to make war and when and how not to, mm -hmm. you know, to, for the common weal, for the commonwealth, for the common good, mm -hmm. is to protect your people. And that was still fundamental to kingship. Mm -hmm. So, and Henry was, he was about 11 years old at the gunpowder plot? Uh, he was 12. 12, okay. Yeah. Um, but you grew up quick. I right. Mean, yeah. I mean, you, you know, uh, John Donne, the great poet, uh, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Jacobean poet, was, um, you know, an ambassador by the age of 16. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you did grow up quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, it seemed like even from a very early age, he was being tutored in, in very adv advanced subjects. So. Yeah. Yeah, the, ed the education of a Christian prince was an obsession. Because the kings ruled as well as reigned, mm -hmm. the quality of your leader was probably going to have a great effect on the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. I, could he, was he strong enough mm -hmm. to resist predators and keep the country secure? And security and peace allows for uh, trade, commerce, lines of credit, and prosperity. So it really mattered the quality of your of your leadership. This may be outside of the scope of the book, but when did when did uh, kings and princesses princes mm. um, when did that uh, educating them that sharply or that intensely really start? Because you think you know the the medieval times, it was just you know bash your enemy in the head and. Mm. You know, or is that too simplistic? No, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, I think it's a Renaissance thing. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a Renaissance prince. So from the moment the Renaissance hits, and I think that the coming of the Renaissance also seems to meet um, state building mm -hmm. when certain countries emerge. Mm -hmm. For example, if you think of England and the Wars of the Roses and the Plantagenets mm -hmm. and... Um, kings on the throne, kings off the throne. I mean, it, it was so unstable. The minute you get a stable entity as a, as a ruler, mm. uh, simply keeping the peace uh, becomes the initial goal. Then once you've done that, you can start to build up the strength of your country. Mm -hmm. And certainly Erasmus, who I can't remember the Latin title, but anyway, in English, it's the education of a Christian prince. Mm -hmm. Erasmus wrote that for Charles V, of Spain, I think, when he was growing up as a boy. Mm -hmm. And it became one of those um, books where he was creating very explicitly a, a godly Renaissance prince. Mm -hmm. And he came over and met Henry VIII. And, and that, that um, idea of civilized kingship mm -hmm. certainly traces back to the Renaissance, where you, you would create a person who was both learned, civilized, um, appreciative of the arts, a philosopher, and also had a strong sword arm. Mm -hmm. You've got to be all things to all people. So in the book, you present Henry as uh, someone who, you know, is very good at the uh, physical activities. And I think as far as his studies, he, he applied himself, but it seemed that he didn't apply himself as much as his father mm -hmm. perhaps wanted to. And I was also struck by, uh, you mentioned the symbol he wore, and I never thought of it this way, St. George and the Dragon mm -hmm. being a uh, Protestant St. George slaying the Catholic dragon. Yes, that was the, that, that, that certainly, um, in their reading of the visual language, they would have read that. Yes, you're right, because the cover of the book has him, very young actually, he's only been in England, very interesting cover, he's dressed in Tudor colours, the Tudor livery colours are dark green and white, the Stuart livery colours are red and white, hmm. so this is Elizabeth's heir, he's wearing Tudor colours, hmm. that's emphasising that these Stuarts are the proper heirs of the Tudors. Hmm. Uh, he also is, it's the first royal action picture portrait. Uh -huh. He's drawing a sword out or he's about to sheathe it again. He's got that kind of age old stare that royal portraits have always got, you know, the old eyes in the young face. Mm -hmm. They're summing you up as much as you're trying to sum them up. Mm -hmm. And he is just about to dispatch a stag that's at his feet. Mm -hmm. And he's wearing, of course, that George and the dragon enameled and gold. Still survives that George and the Dragon that's hanging at his belt. Mm -hmm. This is um, onward Christian soldiers marching out to war, where his father, of course, is completely different. Mm -hmm. James chose as his motto, um, Beati Pacifici, blessed are the peacemakers. Oh. So we've got the Sermon on the Mount meeting onward Christian soldiers. Mm -hmm. They are very different men, the mm -hmm. King James 
and his son, Prince Henry. They get on very well, but they're very different men. So I was also struck by um, early in his life, the, the incident where he was, uh, or where he was presented as, as a gift, um, the wooden ship, oh, the yes. small model ship. And yes, he, you yes. said he loved it. Yes, he did. He did. I, I think he got that love from um, from his mother's side. You know, Denmark was one of the premier Renaissance countries in this period. People don't remember that. Mm -hmm. But his uncle, Christian IV of Denmark, his mother's brother, um, Henry's uncle, uh, renovated the Danish Navy until it was the best Navy in Europe. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was very wealthy. Being where Denmark is, it controls the entrance to the to the um, Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. which was fabulously wealthy set of Hanseatic trading ports, mm -hmm. uh, which it charged a toll on every ship that went hither and thither. Mm -hmm. He knocked down and rebuilt most of Copenhagen. So it was very civilized. The House of Oldenburg was a very civilized, advanced monarchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Christian the Fourth came to visit the Stuarts once they'd inherited everything of Elizabeth the first, all her houses, all her possessions and everything. Mm -hmm. He came and he inspected the Navy and of course he brought some ships with him. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, Henry showed off. Henry had been given the victory by his father at that point, but the victory had seen service in the Armada in 1588. Mm -hmm. And Christian the fourth comes in 1606. So the Armada is a lady of a certain age. I mean, the victory mm. is the lady of a certain age at this point and in poor repair. And he sort of sees the Navy through his uncle's eyes. Mm. And his uncle must pick up on something because they, they give each other lavish gifts when they're parting. But what his uncle, Christian the fourth of Denmark, gives Henry Stuart, Prince of Wales, is a warship. Mm -hmm. He gives him his best warship, the Vice Admiral, fully equipped. Mm -hmm. And I think he is recognising that this is a seagoing power that is currently in decline, mm -hmm. at, but that may not last mm -hmm. under this boy. I think he's very interested. When you say that Den Denmark had the strongest navy, do you mean in terms of quality or yes. quantity or both? Yeah, both, both. It was it was big and it was modern. Okay. And, and it was... Um, and it, but, but Henry really has no power at this point. He is not the Lord High Admiral, mm -hmm. High Admiral. Mm -hmm. uh, a very ancient man called the Earl of Nottingham was. And again, he was Elizabeth's Lord High Admiral under the, in the Armada War. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's exhausted and Henry wants to be the Lord High Admiral. Mm -hmm. And he starts to undertake a, a review of the Navy, the mm -hmm. Royal Navy. The Royal Navy is, is decrepit and the Royal Naval dockyards are famously corrupt. Mm -hmm. You know, shipbuilders, yeah. the shipmasters, when they're asked to order uh, timber for ships, will very often order double what they need and flog off the rest of it. Mm -hmm. When they're asked to renovate boats, they do it on the cheap. Mm -hmm. Walter Raleigh is always complaining about this. You get a Royal Navy boat out into the English Channel and it starts fleaking straight away. Yeah. You know, so it's hopeless. Yeah. Uh, and Henry wants to tighten all that up. But he, he, as well as the Navy, he's also interested in in, as you were saying earlier, the, the military arts. Mm -hmm. And he's learning that from the great military genius, Morris of Nassau, mm -hmm. who has, who writes what will be the gold standard of infantry training for mm -hmm. the next 50 years, mm -hmm. a book called The Exercise of Arms, which very interestingly in its English edition, he dedicates to Henry, not mm -hmm. King James. The yeah. fellow, the fellow ruler is James, mm -hmm. but he dedicates it to Henry, uh, in a very weird English. It's something to do with, it's something to do with Prince Henry because of his uh, keenness on the military arts and his often practice in them. I mean, yeah. It's really weird English, yeah. but you get the message. Mm -hmm. You're the man. You're the future. So it makes me wonder how did I, I know Henry was surrounded with teachers who, or at least I think that's what you say in the book. He was surrounded by teachers who, who gave him, you know, sort of this intense feeling towards his religion. Yeah. Um, yes. And towards protecting England. Mm. And I got the sense that Henry was not so much anti-Catholic as he was very pro-Protestant, like he wanted to be the defender of the faith. You know? Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right. And that shows in two ways. In Europe, uh, in the first years of James's reign, James is quite right to call himself, um, you know, uh, 
blessed are the peacemakers, the king of peace, basically. That's what he wants to be seen as, Europe's Solomon. Uh, and Europe has an uneasy pause in its religious strife. At this point in the recording, my uh, primary recorder, uh, the batteries died, so I switched to another recorder. So we interrupted briefly and then picked up the conversation where we had left off. So we're saying that um, Henry is not so much anti-Catholic as devoutly and passionately pro-Protestant. Mm. Uh, and I think that's right. He has been brought up by godly militant internationalists who sincerely believe they are godly, so they're at the more Puritan end of religion. They are militant, they're prepared to put boots on the ground for mm. their faith. And they're internationalist in that they see, before they see an English Protestantism or a Scottish Calvinism, mm. they see uh, the international brotherhood of Protestants. Mm. They are, uh, it's Christendom, it's all Christendom, they are members of Christendom. And Henry wishes to promote that and he's doing it in the teeth of a reviving Catholicism. Mm. Spain has suffered from what I think we'd all agree was imperial overreach mm -hmm. by the end of the 1500s. Mm. Uh, even despite the mountains of silver and gold they've mined out of South America, they are on the back foot. Mm. And But they are now resurgent in during Henry's lifetime and they are becoming more militant themselves. They form a league, the Catholic League, La Liga, mm. and they are trying to unroll the uh, Protestant Reformation and roll Catholicism back over Europe from end to end. Mm. So a lot of Henry's allies are feeling Spain and the Holy Roman Empire and the papacy breathing down their necks. Mm. And Henry believes it's his Christian duty to his fellow Protestant brothers of Christendom to help defend them. And he is pushing his father to join the Protestant League, which is called the Evangelical Union of Protestant Princes. Mm -hmm. And the problem with these is that these two organizations will both have militant faces as well as pacific faces who believe in talking things through. Mm -hmm. um, and he also devoutly believes, so he's got that on a sort of geopolitical front. Mm -hmm. And then on a purely theological front, he he believes that um, it is God's will, you know, that Protestant Reformation is good with a capital G. Mm. And behind his desire to plant the British race permanently on American soil for the first time, mm -hmm. which he is part of in 1607, he is a, he's closely involved in that, um, is to found the New Jerusalem here. Part of the motivation for that. Mm. is to found the New Jerusalem. This is 13 years before the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. And they they see what they think they see in Europe is this old muddle, which, of course, everyone's always seen in Europe of countries and faiths and cultures and currencies and everything. Mm. Um, and they see a chance to found a, as I say, a New Jerusalem, a pure Protestant country, which is purely Protestant and and utterly Protestant as they as in their in their view of it mm -hmm. um, and and he's he's Protestant in that way as well there's an evangelizing side to him mm -hmm. reading the part about the Puritans role within the society mm. kind of gave me a different view of the Puritans and the Mayflower because mm. I always thought so the Puritans seem to have a stronger place in England than I thought they had yes um, they're a minority they are a minority. Uh, at but, this time. You know, right. Yeah. Um, though they were still, it seemed, the Protestant, Protestants in general were the majority in England yes, at this time. At what we what became Anglicanism mm -hmm. is the majority. It's, it's not called Anglicanism, but it is that what it's basically got is the doctrine of um, Calvinist Protestantism mostly. Actually, mm -hmm. I don't, doesn't believe in predestination. It's got a Protestant doctrine mm -hmm. with an awful lot of Catholic residue, mm -hmm. uh, bishops, robes, mm -hmm. music, smells and bells. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a funny scarecrow of a thing. English so Protestantism. It seemed that at, at some point, it seemed that the Puritans thought they could have some influence on how Henry was brought up. Is that? Yes, yes, they did. And they did. 
I mean, as I say, his his um, a lot of the people around Henry are at what we call the godly end of Protestantism, the Calvinist end, believing in predestination, mm -hmm. um, believing in they all they're also quite politically radical because the one of the fundamentals of their faith is that essentially there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. in which Christ Jesus is king, mm -hmm. and then there are the kingdoms of the earth, where the king might be king. And in that kingdom, he is the king. But in the kingdom of heaven, of course, he's simply another subject, mm -hmm. another equal. He is, he is, he is equal with all the rest. And so there is, there is the beginnings of a political radicalism there, mm -hmm. where their view of the kingdom of heaven could affect how they then view the kingdom on earth. And that will, that, you'll see that more, obviously, in, Henry's brother's reign, Charles I, when the Puritans rise politically mm. and the civil wars break out in, in Ireland and England and Scotland at the end of the 1630s. Mm. The reason that the Mayflower pilgrims set sail in 1621 is because of, um, because, because if there's one Christian sect that James VI and I can't abide, it's what he calls rashy headed preachers. And he tells Henry to beware of them. And by that, he means the Puritans because they will not acknowledge him as head of the church on earth, which of course, as King of England, he is. Um, they are subversive and radical in his view and he marginalizes them. And James won't die till 1625. Mm -hmm. And then when Charles comes on the throne, he is even more high Anglican. Uh, absolute divine monarch, absolute, you know, divine right monarch. He's, he is, he sees his monarchy as a sacred and holy calling. Mm -hmm. Uh, for all the good it did him. I mean, you know, he loses his head, doesn't he, in January 1649. <laughs> and they call him Charles Stuart, that man of blood. You see, they won't, they won't even see him as a king then. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it is a real muddle. I mean, this is all tying up with what you were saying at the beginning about the, it's, they're in transition between these old world of apparent certainties where there's one religion, Catholicism. Mm -hmm. The king is the absolute monarch. Uh, he rules with a council. What we're now going to get are competing versions mm -hmm. of, of political reality and of monarchy and of the desire to see a king in parliament and, and a much a liberating of that old medieval system mm -hmm. into something we begin to recognize as a constitutional monarchy and then a parliamentary monarchy. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to think how things might have been different had Henry, you know, lived mm. uh, beyond, you know, into his later years. Um, but I am curious what he accomplished while he was alive, you know, the, the short yeah. period when he had a lot of, you know, a fair amount of influence. Yeah. Can you discuss some of this stuff? Well, I, I mean, the, the, initially, because I'm talking to you, the founding of British America. Mm -hmm. I mean, James was quite keen on that, but Henry was very, very keen on it. Mm -hmm. And that's why he became the patron of the Virginia Company. Mm -hmm. He had taken on board that Raleigh, Walt, Sir Walter Raleigh maxim, that whoever controls the seas controls the trade. Whoever controls the trade controls the riches of the world and therefore whoever controls the riches of the world controls the world. And they envisaged a, the opportunity to exploit North America the way the Spanish had ex exploited mm. South America in order to promote, mm. uh, and, and help the Protestant cause. So he was very, and the Spanish acknowledged that the Spanish are incensed to find that Prince Henry is getting himself quite so involved in this. Mm -hmm. What he also does is he is, um, he makes himself, I think he is more aware of Parliament than his brother or his father ever will be. The monarchy is becoming poorer in this period. Mm -hmm. It used to be, the phrase they said was, it had to live of its own, i.e. from the um rent and income of its own assets. Mm -hmm. These had been sold off by Elizabeth to fund the Armada War, quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. When the Stuarts arrive, instead of one frugal Tudor, you've got three very, very extravagant Stuarts, and mm -hmm. they are all extravagant. Yeah. Um, and very soon the royal debts are massive. Now, the obvious way to fund them is to, um, through parliamentary through a civil list, the beginning of a regular levy through Parliament. Mm. Now, if that's 
going to happen, then the king is going to have to be a king in parliament because parliament is going to want him to account for the money they're giving him. Mm. So your, your money will bring you, the economics will bring you into a closer relationship. And Henry is tutored by, he's mentored, not tutored, he's mentored by Robert Salisbury, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Cecil Earl of Salisbury, the great Elizabethan minister. He is brought onto the Privy Council. He is beginning to, as I say, he when he pushes to have himself made Prince of Wales, Henry wants himself created Prince of Wales in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Now, not only does that give him a lot of status because it's a state occasion and it's a quasi coronation, mm -hmm. and he looks like a little slightly paler version of the king, mm -hmm. but also the fact that it's done in Parliament with the Lords and the Commons and the City of London and the Lord Mayor and the Alderman and the all the foreign ambassadors. This he is he is showing you the way in which he's going to rule. Um, he does that. What he also does, just from a point of view of a Renaissance point of uh, illustrating the Renaissance maxim, really that magnificence is a tool of power. Mm -hmm. I mean, all those great artworks. He begins the he really sets the royal collection on a new footing before there were just an awful lot of pictures of your ancestors and they were basically like photographs fellow monarchs exchange pictures in order to show who they were allied to and who they were related to mm -hmm. but he starts to um develop an aesthetic sense because they believed that works of art which were had spiritual value had the ability to elevate public discourse Mm -hmm. be beyond the merely venal mm -hmm. and Henry starts collecting paintings, coins, intaglios, suits of armour, uh, sculptures, statues on a scale that's never been seen before mm -hmm. and his brother will take that over. So he is creating a very different vision of monarchy. Wow, so he's, uh, wow, he, he seems for, for a young man, again we said you learn quickly in this age, Yeah. Um, but he seems to have a very strategic and broad outlook as far as how he's going to establish his his power both internally and externally yeah i think he's interested in power i think he is he is from the age of four when his formal education begins mm -hmm. and it's very demanding as you as you've commented at sterling castle that's where he is at that time mm -hmm. um he is being prepared to rule and there's another thing that happens because he's very ready uh, really it's partly due to the way James rules once he comes to England. James the Sixth of Scotland is a very active and hands-on king. When he becomes to England and becomes James the First of England as well, mm -hmm. James is not really interested. He hates Whitehall. He is away hunting for six months of the year. Mm -hmm. um, he's very active. I mean, he, he, he's answering dispatches every day, but he just isn't there. So when foreign delegates and diplomats come and there's certain business that needs to be transacted, the, the junior courts, which is the court of the Queen, and the court of the air, mm -hmm. these become arenas of power in their own right. Oh. So, for example, the military wing of the establishment, which is very unwelcome at James's court, naturally is not going to gather at the Queen's court. It starts to gather around Henry because it's congenial oh. for them there. Mm -hmm. And because we are heading towards what's called the Thirty Years' War, which will start a few years after Henry's death, the longest, bloodiest, continuous conflict in early modern history, up to half the population of certain German states will die. Hmm. Um, that that's, the, the people who are preparing to take part in that are, are coming to Henry's court and discussing modern I innovations in warfare. Mm -hmm. And so there's that as well. He is gathering those people around him. Mm -hmm. And of course, some of the people he's gathering around him there, I mean, talk about biting the hand that feeds you. Uh, they disappear from history for, short, for a short while after Henry dies, and they reappear in what we call the English Civil War, but on the parliamentarian side. Huh. So you get certain aristocrats like the Earl of Essex, the Earl of Warwick, who appear on the parliamentarian side, and they do so because of because they were brought up with Henry. Mm -hmm. So they believe in Parliament, they believe in Protestantism, they they see the king as a threat. Mm -hmm. It sounds like he created um, some enduring. Enduring foundations uh, that that affected history well beyond yeah. his passing. Oh yes, very much. 
So, huh. Very interesting. Yeah. Not stuff that people talk... You know, I guess if you never become king, people just kind of, eh, whatever. Yeah, Victor Ludorum. Yeah, I mean, history is written by the victors, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, no, to die is... Abs- well, it's fatal in every way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, now we discussed a lot of the book. Are there any uh, secondary issues that you discussed that we haven't touched on yet? No. Don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's so many things in a book. Do you know what I mean? Mm. We're just sort of cherry-picking little bits out of it. Yeah. Yeah. What resources did he use to uh, do your research? I, I guess the way we all do it, historians, you do you primary and secondary. Mm-hmm. So by that I mean secondary is the historians, particularly the tenured historians in the universities who have written about this period, mm-hmm. because they their research is so good and they are the ones who um, are really thinking about in new ways about it but then you have to go back to the primary materials and read those for yourself mm-hmm. and see what you think of them so the British Library in London the um, Royal Archives the National Archives rather at Kew mm-hmm. in London the Royal Archives at Windsor the National Library of Scotland the Scottish Record Office those where letters are held mm-hmm. where letters um, and drafts of and drafts of um, declarations and uh, but really you're looking for letters you're looking for notes to each other because that's the sort of thing that brings people to life and of course in the British Library what they've got is the first ever map of the Chesapeake Bay area right. it's uh, made in 1607 by Henry's gunner a man called Robert Tyndall mm-hmm. uh, for Henry on that first voyage with the Susan Constant and the Godspeed that founds basically Jamestown and then Henrico, which is a suburb now of Richmond. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a wonderful thing. It's vellum, so it's very thick, you know, it's high, you know, it's beaten hide. Mm -hmm. And it's about three feet long and two feet deep uh, with a lovely green and cherry colored and gold border. Uh, It's alarmingly empty, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, because they always are. These, I mean, it's an absolute imperialist's dream. Mm-hmm. You know, just fill it in as you like. Yeah. You know, and it's got very little on it. It's got Cape Henry and it's got Jamestown, but it's quite. When you unwrap it, what strikes you immediately is how fresh and freshly coloured it is. Oh, you yeah. can imagine what it would have been like for Henry to unwrap it. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's all of that kind of thing. It's the, it's the diligent things of research, just reading the proper letters in their handwriting, but also the the little gifts, like suddenly unrolling that map, mm. and that's been there since 1607. And because it's vellum, you can see the little pore holes where the, where the animal's hide would have been, the hair that they scraped oh. off to make the vellum. I mean, it's so fresh. Wow. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, I hope they lend it. I hope it's been lent often to America, because, I mean, it's uh, yours. Yeah. You know? I, I don't know. But I actually have uh, driven through and around Henrico plenty of times and, and never did I imagine it was named after yeah him you know, Henry Prince, Prince of Wales yeah. Yeah. yeah um that's pretty cool yeah and the first college actually Henry Co College oh yeah which was for um you you know training for training people to well really of course to convert the indigenous mm. people that's one of its main aims naturally yeah. but uh, to establish a center of learning here the first center of learning was Henry Co College wow tiny I think yeah. it was so, um, did you come across doc? You mentioned the one map, but uh, how many other documents did you find that perhaps researchers hadn't used much before? What more than what they haven't found before are is just is using them because they haven't been used before. Because as you say, Henry died mm-hmm. and his brother Charles um, inherited. These letters have not been considered very important, so they're not read very closely. So people know they're there, they're there, right. but they don't consult them very well. So it's it's really using those letters to bring that person back to life. Mm-hmm. That that's what you're doing. That's new. You know, hearing his own voice in his own handwriting. Mm-hmm. And his own asides, you know, for example, this Stuart extravagance. Mm-hmm. He's writing to Robert Earl, uh, Robert Cecil Earl of Salisbury. Um, asking him about some little financial bit of wheeler dealing he's trying to arrange. And then he says, because I am like to prove an unthrift. Oh, yeah. <laughs> an unthrift. Love that word. <laughs> you know, it's a rather forlorn admission there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's, uh, so how is his handwriting? 
it's, I mean, considering it's over 400 years old, it's surprisingly legible. Of course, the ink gets faint. Oh. And he writes formally. He has two forms of handwriting. One is when he is writing formal letters to uh, fellow princes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that is very clear, but it, and often in Latin. Mm -hmm. And then his notes, quick notes. They, they're writing quick notes to each other every day because no telephone. Mm -hmm. And they're probably not even living in the same palace because they're all in different places. Mm -hmm. But messengers are carrying notes to each other every day. Mm -hmm. But paper's very expensive. So it's literally, it's scrap, you can get scraps of paper, mm -hmm. even for royal letters. You can get little scraps of paper, three inches deep and maybe six inches across, mm -hmm. and quite jagged. And a little note, yes. hurriedly written by Princess Elizabeth or Charles, uh, Prince Charles or or Henry, uh, in English or French. Those mm. will all be in English or French because these are sort of the, their court languages. I mean, their mother mm. tongue is English, but they also speak French fluently. Right. Yeah. Um, apart from the map, did he come across any other interesting artifacts related to this? Oh, well, yes. I mean, all the artworks and things that, that were given to him and, and he collected, um, mm. you know. Well, of course, the most interesting thing was the thing that started it all off was his effigy. His effigy, um, the effigy that was made when he died recreated him as he was in life at the, at really at one of the peaks of his life, which was his creation as Prince of Wales mm. in his purple velvet robes, ermine lined, um, with, uh, his, with the scepter, the wand, with his coronet on and a wax head. I mean, as realistic as, as was well, not wax actually, it's gesso it's made of. Mm. Um, but it is, they're as realistic as anything out of Madame Two Swords. Mm. And that was on the beer as, as he was on top of his coffin as it was being towed to West, pulled to Westminster Abbey. Mm. And that was ravaged by souvenir hunters in uh. the months uh, after his death until someone even took his head several years later. Mm. So if you go now, they're creating galleries in Westminster Abbey and what's called the Triforium. You know, it's a thousand years old, this church. Mm -hmm. The Triforium is 80 feet above the nave. Mm -hmm. So you've got, to, you've got to have a head for heights to go up there. And they're making a new gallery right now for all the royal effigies. Oh, it's wow. opening this year. And yeah. his effigy will be there. But all that's left of it, because it was so badly ravaged, is he, it just looks like an artist's mannequin. It's, it's just, it's wood, it's just the wood, the fur, it's made of fur. Mm -hmm. And it's just his arms and legs and and torso. He, there's no head, so it's mm -hmm. a rather forlorn thing. It's a it's a wonderful metaphor for what's happened to him. Yeah. He just disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Though you said he was very popular, and at his death, I guess there was a lot of a lot of sorrow. Yeah, so over. it was a huge public outpouring of grief. Huge. I mean, sixty laments and. Uh, howling and shrieking and it was very like the funeral which must have been on the TV over here as well for, of Princess Diana. Mm -hmm. I mean wailing that sort of eerie wailing in the streets where people have lost something symbolic but they don't quite know what but mm -hmm. there's an animal howl. Mm -hmm. Yeah no it was it was a shocking event. Stunning they didn't expect it. Yeah what part of the research was the most enjoyable? It's the letters it's the letters and coming across things like that map. Mm -hmm. It's anything that gives you, because I'm a, a biographer before I'm a historian, mm -hmm. I'm a really, it's, it's bringing a dead person back to life, mm -hmm. she said ghoulishly, <laughs> <laughs> like Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> but, um, that is what I do. So anything that will give you the little, uh, the, the, the sense of the person, mm -hmm. you know, so when, Anything, when you read, for example, uh, when Henry, as you said, he's a, he's a practical intelligence, not an academical in, academic intelligence. Mm -hmm. And when his tutor berates him, because the king has berated the tutor for not making a bookish boy mm -hmm. that yeah. the king wants, mm -hmm. Henry turns around and lashes out, you know, it is not necessary for me to become a philosopher or a professor like you. I know what becomes a prince. I must become a soldier and a leader of men. And, and you get the man instantly then. Yeah. Ah, you yeah. know, get off my back. Mm -hmm. I know, I know I don't have to be a schoolmaster, mm -hmm. you know. And then they're also the little jokes they crack, you know, when they're just, 
uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but they, they, they're just little bits of banter that you hear. Those mm. things are lovely to come across. So now I, I assume the letters have been sort of archived and, and you yeah. know who's, did you come across any letters that you thought, wait a minute, I think they miss, you know, this is maybe someone else was, had written this or? Uh, well, they are. I mean, a lot of Henry's letters, once he gets older, are written anyway by his um, secretary, by his tutor, who becomes his private secretary. Mm. And he adds bits on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, you get, and you also, I tell you what you get when you're doing research is you get things that are simply missing. Mm -hmm. You get, and you, and that's so frustrating because in a novel you can make it up because you know it's enough circumstantial evidence is there that you know what the missing bit is. But of course you can't do that with a biography or history. Yeah. So that is, that absolutely does your head in. Oh, really? Because you want to hear them say it. Yeah. Because everyone's acting as if they've already heard him say it, so they're reacting to it. Yeah. But where is it, him saying it? Yeah. So you're left with those weasel words like, Henry must have been furious hearing this, that and the other. Yeah. You know, whereas you don't have him being furious, it's just everyone else says he was. Yeah. You know, it's that. <laughs> what did you find that was most surprising in your research? I think, even though I quite casually say now, of course, they grew up quickly is how worldly they were how adult they had to be how quickly you know henry's henry and his friends henry is receiving diplomats from the age of 10 his friends are going off on their grand tours but they're basically his unofficial diplomatic representatives from his court by the age of 14 or 16 and they are all expected to behave maturely they, they're all thinking about going to war i mean we are used to thinking of boy soldiers you know in world war one and so on but nevertheless the, they seem so adult mm -hmm. compared with um with us today i mean they don't have a category of teenager right you know you don't you're a child or you're an adult yeah and it is they are so adult so quickly. I mean, when you think of the little we expect in terms of responsibility, Henry's responsible, really. And you see him, he, he, he lays out the running of his household from the age of 15, 16. Mm -hmm. um, hundreds of people depend on him. Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of help, but he also is very involved in it as well. Mm -hmm. And he has his own views on things, a lot of them, you know, it's, it's his court and his court is not like his father's court, which is why his father complains. Mm. It's got his stamp on it yeah. as well as the people who are making him. And I think it's that that's always surprising is um, how mature they are mm -hmm. compared with all of us the way we were. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But they still seem to, have, you know, they play games, they have their yeah. parties. So yeah. is there, could you identify an age where... They were basically told, okay, you know, in a, you know, you're no longer a child prince. Now you're an adult prince. Is well, there... I think with Henry, it's probably when he's about 13. Mm -hmm. It's when his, his household changes to what they call a collegiate court. Mm -hmm. And then the people who are going to help him reign and rule are gathered about him and, mm -hmm. and, and they are very definitely being trained to rule the country, these mm -hmm. boys, and it's about 13. And would that also apply to, I guess, Charles and his sister was Elizabeth? Was yes, Elizabeth. Name? And Elizabeth became a character who's known in history as the Winter Queen, Elizabeth of Bohemia. Mm -hmm. She uh, she and her husband will actually kick off this, this 30 years war, this uh. religious conflagration in Europe. She, in some ways, is Henry's ideological heir. Henry could have been hugely destructive. I think we'd have had no civil war in England, Scotland or Ireland, but but England certainly would have gone headlong into the Thirty Years' War on the continent, mm. and that might have been disastrous. Mm -hmm. So he's, um, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. Oh, uh, oh, I was asking, um, as far as Charles and Elizabeth, would they yeah. have had the same sort of intense uh, tutoring you know, would they have followed the same path that Henry did as far as education and... and yeah, they're very well educated, um, less intensively, mm -hmm. um, but Charles was very bookish, so he was naturally a scholar, so that helped. And he, he, he adored Henry, mm -hmm. and he, he lived with Henry for half the time, so when this military salon starts to 
um, come together naturally at Henry's court with soldiers gathering at Henry's court when the campaign season ends in the autumn yeah. because nobody, no, nobody would fall fights in the winter because you can't move right. for the mud yeah. you know um, when they when when they're in when the campaign season is closed they all come back to Henry's court and Charles is there most of the time mm -hmm. so he is learning a lot from Henry he's exposed to all of that yeah oh yeah as well. <laughs> now you mentioned um, being bothered by having not having some letters you know, people suggest or refer to things he did and you can't find specific instances when he writes about it. But uh, was there anything else that was very difficult about your research? Yes, I think the whole book is difficult because he doesn't become king. Yeah. And I mean, that is the point. That's the whole, the point of him. So what you're doing is writing about the making of a king mm -hmm. who then doesn't become king. Mm -hmm. And that's quite difficult. Um, so what you have to do in terms of actual shaping the narrative is you're creating that kind of James Dean moment where, mm -hmm. you know, the golden boy, Icarus, crashes to the ground. Mm -hmm. So that in terms of structure, you've got to, structuring the story is quite difficult. Right. It is difficult, yeah. So was there anything you discovered that emotionally moved you in some way? His end, really. Mm -hmm. The end of the golden boy, you know in that, um, you know, right, I'm thinking of that King Lear thing of Shakespeare, you know, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they mm -hmm. kill us for their sport. Mm -hmm. He's killed, you know, snuff, he's out. And, you know, for all his training, for all his achievements, for everything, he ends up being uh, the most appalling, heart-rending death. Writing his death was difficult because when you've brought someone to life, you mind. Mm -hmm. And in a funny way, you imagine they won't die. Although you know they will, mm -hmm. there's something about the writing of it uh -huh. where you don't take that on board. And so when you're in that last few weeks and you know exactly, I know to the hour when he's going to die, mm -hmm. um, it's horrible to write that. And then he goes down into the crypt, you know, to join what the um, Jacobeans called the Ragged Regiment. Uh -huh. You know, the play of the dead folks, huh. you know, just the, the effigies down in, down in the crypt. This, this kind of life force, this tour de force mm. is reduced to being a ragged effigy in a crypt. Mm -hmm. That is awful. Especially if you've got boys. I've got two boys. Mm -hmm. And one of them was the age Henry was when he died when mm. I started writing this book and there's something again it's against nature to write the death of those boys you know it's ugh. Mm -hmm. you know there's but that's just that those are the personal things so when you were done I guess you felt you know you have your usual not emptiness but you know yes. you, you feel like something's missing when you end a book but then yes, it seems exactly. like this had an extra extra bit of of emptiness yes that's so right and a bit of heartbreak Mm -hmm. You know, you're heartbroken broken for him because you've, you've grown up with him and you know his hopes and his dreams and mm -hmm. and his idiocies and his faults and his stubbornness and mm -hmm. his arrogance and, you know, all the good and bad things about him. But you, it's awful to, when they die. How many uh, at his funeral was there much in the way of military elements? Maybe um, beyond that. Not overtly. It was a huge state funeral. It was the biggest, uh, biggest state funeral for a long time. It was bigger than Elizabeth, the one for Elizabeth I. I yeah. mean, her state funeral, mind you, her was, I mean, Henry's funeral was about a quarter to a half as big again. It was absolutely massive. Wow. Um, and the, the king and queen couldn't attend. They were too, they were devastated. Mm. So Charles, Prince Charles had to lead the mourners. His brother had to lead the mourners. Um, but it wasn't particular well except to you know if you think of his beer yeah. yes the beer which the illustrations in the book mm -hmm. this that's got all his penance his titles it's got his mottos and his mottos they're very clearly carved onto it this great big wooden beer that had to be drawn by eight black war horses mm. um um one of his mottos was he delights to go upon the deep you mm. know he delivered this that was his sailing you know his father gave him that motto actually when, when he became patron of the Northwest Passage Company, mm -hmm. and he. Or the other motto was in English: um, uh, "Glory is the torch of the upright mind," you know, mm -hmm. meaning heroic deeds winning glory on the field of battle. Uh -huh. And there they are with all the Prince of Wales pennants and things flying away. 
And the other motto he chose was, um, yeah, it is right to seek for other countries. You know, so he wanted to go out and, um, and claim new worlds and discover new worlds. So all of those, you know, the, all of that is in that image, I suppose. Mm-hmm. That, that would all be picked up. I mean, that visual, they were very, very much more, um, visually sophisticated in their visual literacy than I think we are now. Yeah. It's a very complex language. Yeah. So what do you hope the book will do in the field of English history or history in general? Put him back into history. Mm. I mean, that's what you want. You want to bring these people back into history. And also, uh, in terms of um, the narrative of the rise of Puritanism up to the destruction of the monarchy under Charles I and the Puritan Republic under Cromwell, when it's kind of like Narnia, it's always Christmas, always winter and never Christmas. <laughs> you know, we get that for a while. Um, but what I hope is that the the growth, one of the hot spots where Protestantism really takes root and grows, although it goes underground for a while, it will be seen to be starting right back at the beginning of the 1600s. It's a long growth. It's not a sudden eruption of puritanical fervor. Mm -hmm. This is a long tradition of religious and political thinking that's got roots. Mm -hmm. And Henry is one of those way stations Mm -hmm. where it gathers some force. Can you speak to any difficulties you had in getting the book published and how you overcame them? Uh, No, because what I did was I pitched to HarperCollins to do his father, James VI and I. And they said, we've just done that not long ago, but how about doing his son, Henry? Yeah. And I said yes. Okay. And that's how it went. <laughs> okay. And as far as the did the, I guess the writing was on schedule. There were no hiccups or it was. No, all I smooth. wanted to get it done on time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just kept going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your next writing project? Uh, funnily enough, at the moment I am working on fiction, Jacobite fiction, because my first book was a Jacobite biography. Mm-hmm. So I'm going forward. I mean, I've just done the Jacobeans, which mm. is the era of James the I and Shakespeare and Ben Johnson. Mm. And now I'm going forward to the Jacobites, which is, of course, Bonnie Prince Charlie mm. and the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. Mm. And because my first book was about that period, and I'm going back to that period. Mm-hmm. That actually reminds me, I did, the part I've read so far, you did mention uh, Shakespeare's, uh, what, what were they called? The, the King's Men? Yeah, the King, King's Players. The King's Players. Shakespeare's company were the King's Players, yeah. Do, are, do you discuss them? Do they come up more further on in the book, or is it? Um, not particularly. The only point I'm making there is how does a kind of yeoman's son from Stratford on Avon come to be writing with such um, profundity about kingship? legitimacy, right rule. Mm-hmm. Well, the King's players, when, as I'm point I make in the book, when they are not playing uh, uh, King Lear or Antony and Cleopatra at royal feasts and at diplomatic events are gentlemen ushers in ordinary. They basically help serve at the tables. Mm-hmm. And so they are around the court the whole time. Mm-hmm. So Shakespeare is somebody who will have picked up an awful lot of the political gossip mm-hmm. about ruling and monarchs and kingship and he will as as well as his reading of plutarch's you know lives and things like that so it, it's just they don't they're there that's why they know yeah. it's kind of an odd thought and maybe this is a whimsical comment but it's almost as though you know saturday night live players or so, you know a, th- a broadway theater company were also you know, worked at the White House. That's exactly, you know? <laughs> that is a that is a correct analogy. And what they would have to say about power and how power works and how it should work, mm-hmm. you know, and they would be quite right. I mean, that is what all these playwrights like Ben Johnson and, and Shakespeare are exploring mm-hmm. is is the is the wielding of power. Mm-hmm. I mean, it affects us all mm-hmm. how how power is wielded, how our rulers rule. Mm-hmm. And then you look at Shakespeare's place, and there's so much, there's so much uh, military stuff, you know, conflict, mm. you know, yeah. obviously. So yeah, yeah. Well, also you look at King Lear, and mm. this that I make up that point in the book. Mm-hmm. King Lear is about a king who right suddenly arrives and says, "I have, um, you know, I've done my ruling, 
and I'm now going to have a lovely time going hunting and going from place to place, hunting lodge and visiting my children and my children are going to rule in my place. And so he doesn't abdicate, but he just isn't there ruling the whole time. And the whole country goes to hell in a handcart. Mm -hmm. Now, James the sixth and first has come to England and that is precisely what he's done. Mm -hmm. He has, he has gone hunting for six months of every year mm -hmm. and created a bit of a power vacuum at the center in mm -hmm. some ways. Uh, also, he, he toys with the idea after the gunpowder plot of scooping Henry away and putting him back in Scotland mm -hmm. behind the craggy walls of Stirling Castle mm -hmm. uh, for the next 10 years to protect him. Yeah. And what Shakespeare is saying is obviously don't do that mm -hmm. because you are almost creating another court and another kingdom. Mm -hmm. And you could create the, you know, the conditions for civil conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are disaffected with your rule or discontented, mm -hmm. like the Catholics have been because they just tried to blow you up. Mm -hmm. They, you know, or the Puritans say they might then go and gather with Henry and Henry might then be encouraged to come and depose you and take over because you have unfitted yourself for rule. You know, he's examining mm -hmm. the consequences of the actions of the rulers all the time. So having playwrights in the court, was that sort of a way to develop, you know, propaganda to the people or were they looking to the playwrights to sort of give them an idea of what the people were thinking? What they're looking for, um, plays and playing are ways of discussing things that can't be discussed so openly. Mm. For example, you, you know, these are absolute states. Every play, probably as you know, every play that Shakespeare wrote or anyone else wrote had to go through the public censor before it was stamped, approved, approved material. Huh. Now, if you wanted to get something slightly contentious past the censor, you put it back in the old days in Rome. Huh. You know, Julius <laughs> Caesar, and you're examining populism then, and you know, and demagoguery and things like that. Uh -huh. And, and, and so you, this is, this is, uh, the discourse of po of of power in circulation. It's how it's it's how things are being discussed. I mean, Englishmen at this time are discussing civil liberties and and the liberties due to free born Englishmen, etc., etc., and tyranny. Mm -hmm. And and you, you, if you stylize it into a work of art, you might get away with saying some quite critical things, which you simply couldn't stand up in Parliament and say. Mm -hmm. You'd be arrested. Mm -hmm. And hey, and it, often were, you know. I mean, yeah. Ben Johnson was arrested more than once. <laughs> you know, well, his tried his his Roman satires, Catiline and Sejanus, criticizing the power of great ones, mm. uh, and they were all luxury because because magnificence was a tool of power. They aggrandized themselves, and um, Ro Johnson has a very bitter speech where the great ones of the state enjoy her by turns. Mm. I mean, it's kind of gang yeah. raping the state for her assets. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's brutal, some yeah. of the things they say. But if you place it in ancient Rome, well, then you're not talking about Jacobean London, right. are you? Right. Yeah, right. Wink, wink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so was Henry then a patron of... of he of had plays. his players, yes. And he, he employed Johnson, not Shakespeare. Mm. Ben Johnson was worked for Henry a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What an interesting! I've got a, a bit, a bit off on a tangent there, yeah. but it's still interesting. Yeah. So, where can people find your work? I guess in the Amazon, Amazon and yeah, Amazon. It's published. The this book, the last Highlander, has been out for several years, and mm -hmm. uh, because of Outlander, mm -hmm. because do you know you know that Outlander series? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, the biography I wrote was the actual life of the actual historical figure uh -huh. who is supposed to be the hero's grandfather. Ah, so yeah. my my figure's real, and and the hero Jamie Fraser doesn't exist, of course. But um, yeah. um, and also, and this book, Henry Prince of Wales, the Prince who would be king, has just has just come out this month in mm. in, Amer in the US. Oh, okay, it's out now. And uh, do you don't have like a web page or something that highlights any of your work. Oh, yeah, what, yeah, what is it? SarahFraser.co.uk. Okay, and that's S A R A H. Yeah. F R A S E R. Yeah. Dot co dot UK. Okay. Yeah, and I'm and I'm on Twitter at Sarah underscore Fraser UK. Okay. Twitter and Facebook. Okay. You know. And uh, okay. A any final thoughts or words? 
No, I think I've said enough, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for listening. More information can be found at warscholar.org.